States and South Africa, from policy making to evidence based implementation. So today we have a number of sessions. So we have a session from 10 to 12, which you're in at the moment. We have another one from 12.30 to 2.15. Um, and then we have a 2.30 to 4.30 session. So three sessions today and also a full day of sessions tomorrow as well. So for those of you who've registered, you have to register for each session in order to gain access to it. And of course, as you know, this conference is free of charge. So thank you so much for making the time for being here. Um, without any further ado, I really just want to get started and jumping into this conference because we would ideally like to have had this an in-person conference uh, where people can engage and have robust conversations. But fortunately, we have the technology to enable us to have a virtual engagement. Um, and also there are many advantages. So for example, um, typically with this sort of conference, it would just be people from South Africa who would be able to make presentations and participate. But because it's virtual, we can have people from all over the world participating in this particular conference. So thank you so much again for making the time to be here. So what we're going to do today in this session is we have four speakers. Uh, we have Matotsi Amisi, who's from the Center of Learning and Evaluation and Results at Wits University. Um, she's going to be speaking on introduction to evidence-based approaches. Then next, we're going to have Lizette Lancaster, who's from the Crime Hub at the Institute for Security Studies. And Lizette's going to be speaking on the role of disaggregated, aggregated data for policy making and implementation. And then we're going to have Shanaz Matthews from the Children's Institute, who's going to be talking about the lessons from implementation science. And then finally, we're going to have Lillian Mashele from the Civilian Secretariat for Police Service, um, looking at the evidence and policy making for violence prevention. Um, so before we get started, just uh, to allow the pres before the presenters actually give their input. So what's going to happen in the session is I'm, we're going to just take you through a, a Mentimeter process um, just to get to know who's in the room. Then we're going to allow our speakers to present and then we'll have a bit of a panel discussion after that. And then we'll open it up for questions and comments. Each speaker is going to have five to eight minutes to speak. Um, there'll be about 20 minutes of uh, panel discussion and then hopefully more than enough time for um, questions and comments from the floor. So what I'm going to do now is I just want to share my screen because uh, this is the Mentimeter process. So let me just quickly get into that. Um, second, share my screen. Share. Right. So this is a Mentimeter process. So if you don't mind, for those of you who haven't used Menti before, those who have, if you just go into your web browser to www.menti.com, and then what happens is uh, if you go to that particular website, it'll ask you for a code. So the code is 1727 1557. And if you just go onto that particular site and then answer the questions. So we'll do one question at a time. So if those of you in the room and those of you who are presenting who are able to do it, just go there, just to give us an understanding and an idea of who's in the room. We've got two people that have used it. We've got two academics. And it takes a little bit of time to uh, get familiar with this particular technology. And also it's, it's around kind of accessing particular uh, uh, particular program. Sometimes internet can be a bit slow. So we're just going to give people a bit of a chance. We're starting to get a nice spread here. Quite a lot of academics, someone from government, someone from a number from civil society. Numbers are growing. Nice mix of people. A little bit more time before I go on to the next slide. I've got three slides. I just want you to ask some questions about. Right. I'm now going to move to the next one if it allows me to go to the next one. Second here. Right. Okay. I'm going to go to the next question now. So, what aspects of violence prevention and safety promotion do you mainly work on? So, you've got choices here. Unfortunately, you can't do multiple choices, but just what would be your primary focus of the work? people working on policing, gender-based violence, I see, environmental design, quite a few on policing, gender-based violence picking up. Great. All right, then just to the final slide, 
how many webinars or conferences have you attended this year? So you have four choices here. Your first one, less than five, between five and 10, or just too many to count. You attended way too many. Lots of people attended way too many webinars, but then again, we can get engaged and we can have conversations with our colleagues. All right, I don't want to take any more time. So thanks so much for participating in the Mentimeter. There will be in other sessions Menti may be used. So let me unshare my screen and then we're going to get into the actual presentations. So thanks to everyone again for your patience and participating. So we are going to start in terms of the program that you have. So Matotsi Amisi um, is going to be our first speaker. And Matotsi, you have maximum of eight minutes. So over to you. Thank you, Guy. OK, so I was asked to sort of situate the conversation and to talk about what evidence base um, means in this particular sector. So, I mean, to start off, I think it's important to consider what is the nature of the problem that we're talking to. So violence is considered a wicked problem, uh, like a quicksand. There are numerous respecters, manifestation of violence, and the exposure to violence impact people differently. So what does this mean for evidence? Where there is complexity, our knowledge is often imagined, meaning that what is known about violence, what we know about what works to prevent violence changes over time, often influenced by, uh, by context. There's also a plurality of views on what exactly is violence, um, and how do we solve it? And it was interesting to see the, the, you know, the diversity of the people who are participating even today. Ironically, it is where there is complexity that evidence is important. But what exactly is evidence? And how do we know when it is good enough? And can evidence be the only basis on which decisions um, are made? There are many words that are used in this discussion around evidence use. Researchers speak of uh, research uptake, uh, research into, uh, into policy, evidence-based interventions, evidence-informed uh, interventions. We shouldn't get lost on uh, the academic debate about the differences between this, uh, this different concept. And to do that, it is important to focus on the principle that underlie much of the debate around evidence use. And that is that the knowledge that we generate, the knowledge that we are accumulating should be used to make decisions on what we implement, where we implement it, what we fund, and how we go about implementing it. We should get better at responding at a problem as we accumulate more knowledge. We should abandon that which does not work and strengthen what holds promise. So therefore, the central theme is learning, learning to improve, adapting, and doing things better. In dealing with a complex problem like violence, evidence is going to come um, in many shapes and forms and size and varying quality and rigor. Though most evidence-based uh, conversations often focus on research uh, type of evidence, um, like RCTs, evaluations, research synthesis. It's important to remember that research is but one process that generates credible evidence. There is implementation data, there is implementation science, administrative data, survey data, practice-based knowledge, and all this can be sources of credible evidence upon which decisions can be made, as the speakers are going to reflect more on how these different forms of evidence can be used. Therefore, evidence use is not simply about getting one form of evidence to influence policy and implementation or increasing the influence of research in policy, which often tends to dominate the debates about evidence use. Using evidence itself is not necessarily a straightforward issue. And I'm going to explore five reasons why that's the case. The first is, um, that evidence use itself comes in many different forms. 
there is instrumental evidence use, which is what most people tend to want to look at, which is, you know, if we recommended something for policy or an implementation, did that get implemented? There's also conceptual, which means, you know, we might generate ideas and we might not necessarily see it, uh, you know, as policy implementation, but you, there might be a different way that a problem is being understood. So, you know, our new ideas are, you know, are coming to the fore and is refining the way that we understand the problem. There's also process, which means you know people can learn lessons as they participate in a you know in a um, uh, in an evidence generation process. And I think part of what um, Shanas is going to talk to also probably talks a bit to that. There's also symbolic, which is sometimes negative in a sense that you know a decision has already been made, and we go out to look for 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 evidence to confirm a decision that has been uh, already made. What other people have often called uh, policy based. Um, uh, evidence. The second thing is that policy making itself is a political process that involves negotiation and reconciling competing needs. In that process, evidence is but one aspect that influences, uh, in influences decision. Thirdly, evidence generation itself is not apolitical. Researchers and evaluators can disagree with each other. They can compete with each other. They can have different perspectives, often based on evidence or backed by evidence. This can make it quite difficult for those who are in implementation or in policy to reconcile these differences that all seem to be backed by evidence. With funders increasingly wanting to see policy influence, the competition to demonstrate this influence can cloud researchers' decisions and undermine collaboration, undercutting the very ideal of getting evidence to influence decisions that are being made. Fourthly, the problem of, uh, of violence is often studied from different perspectives, be it criminological, public health, psychological, feminist, and often linked to particular forms of violence, whether GBV, violence against children, community safety, policing, safety, trafficking. The implications is that we tend to know in part, so we know, you know particular forms of violence, but we don't often see the whole and how different forms of violence intersect. And this, minutes. Yeah. and this contributes to a fragmented policy um, response. The last thing is that no evidence generation tool, whether it's you know, research or synthesis, can provide all the answers that policy makers and implementers tend to, uh, to have. When dealing with complexities, Researchers often talk of probabilities, likelihoods, um, and often ending work that we write uh, with needing more research uh, to gain better clarity. However, in the policy environment and implementation environment, people are often needing certainty and clarity. This results in simple solutions that are often not uh, that are often based on scant evidence and are disastrous to society. Like, for example, minimum sentencing gaining traction while interventions that are based and supported by evidence are often not necessarily taken forward because of the um of the complexity so what does this mean and i want to end with this quote what does this mean for the work that um that, that we're doing this does not mean that evidence is not important or that we shouldn't be making attempts to get better at generating evidence in this sector what it means is that we need to move away from focusing solely on tools and systems and, and, uh, and, and publications, but of thinking about the complexity of this relationship between evidence and, uh, and its utilization. We need to think about the, the context of organizations, the context of the individual that we want to, uh, to influence. We also need to be thinking about relationships that underpin and allows for flows of information uh, between different actors to influence um, to influence decisions that are that are made and I end with this quote because I think in the work that we're doing it is important to continue to generate the evidence but to also recognize the complexity uh, that's involved in making sure that that evidence is used useful and is used in in decision making thank you thanks so much Matozzi. uh 
on time exactly eight minutes. Thank you so much for starting on such a good example and also for giving us a really good introduction to the notion of implementation-based policy making and implementation science. Of course, Shanaz is going to go into a bit more detail about the implementation science in her presentation. But next up, we have Lizette Lancaster from the ISS, Institute for Security Studies, who's going to be talking about the role of disaggregated data. So over to you, Lizette. Thank you, Guy. As I try to share, my screen disappeared. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can see that clearly. Um, thanks for having me. I'm going to talk about one of those building blocks that Matotsi spoke of, the administrative data, such as the crime statistics, and its role that it can play in, um, sorry, there I am, in uh, understanding or providing some form of basis for evidence. Um, this infographic is quite complex, but it contains an overview of the annual crime statistics released by the South African Police Service. And this is the for the last annual release um, in 2020, for the period April 2019 to March 2020. That's before the pandemic hit. And what it shows is that every day thousands of crimes are reported to the police. Over 1.6 million so-called serious crimes, that's 17 categories of what is sort of broad categories that is described as serious crime are recorded um, per year in over 1,150 police stations. The result is a comprehensive database that can provide insights into the nature and extent of crime and violence in South Africa. This is available at a national, provincial and, and station level. It also means that nearly the nearly 190,000 men and women of the SAPS have their hands full having to deal with these crimes considered as serious. So they need to work smartly to get on top of the various drivers and to detect these crimes. However, the traditional use of crime stats is often in the public's mind and, and even policymakers to see if crime is going up and down or down. And often to, it's used to criticize the police for any increases. Each police station level crime stats is an indicate, um, or, or shall I say, often the police itself uh, themselves use station level crime stats as an indicator of performance leading to much anxiety and reluctance to record certain crimes. This has led to the politicization of the crime stats and the reluctance to release detailed and disaggregated information. But this is where we see that the true value of crime stats as an analytical tool is then lost. Also, Increases in crime stats are not always bad. Research shows that proper visible policing and positive police attitudes can even increase reporting rates because of an increase of trust in the criminal justice system. So we might even see more recorded crimes such as for instance, sexual offenses then, a notoriously underreported category. Crime stats, therefore is an analytical tool, as I've said, that, user, that if used well, will identify where a problem is the largest. It should then be used to work with partners in order to address the problems, especially around aspects of violence. It should not be used as an indicator for, of performance, but alternative indicators, such as the measuring of trust and how victims are treated should be prioritized rather as indicators. But even this massive administrative database has some other quite daunting limitations. The first of which is the fact that many crimes do not make it into the crime statistics. So when we look here at 2020 reporting levels, you know, we always debate whether murder should be there or not, because we know that it is the most reliable crime statistic. But when we start looking at others from the Victims of Crime Survey, we see that some are notoriously underreported. 
for various reasons that I don't have the time to discuss right now. But reporting rates also differ from community to community. And that's why with administrative data, you also need things like localized perception surveys to, that help to understand reporting rates, satisfaction levels and trust the, um, and, and other factors that impact on policing practices or, or reporting practices in those communities. This is quite a complicated slide and it's from the crime map and it shows the seasonal data for murder for the past two years and also for the first quarter of this year or known as quarter four of the financial year 2020 to 2021. So what we are seeing is that despite underreporting rates, some crimes um, are show an important or tell an important story that need to be taken into account when we look at how best to develop policy to address crime and violence. Some crime categories such as murder is better to focus on than others. As murder, for instance, is the most reliable crime statistic and the best proxy for violence. Reducing the factors contributing to murder will reduce the violent, uh, violence generally. Murder, like many crimes, are seasonal. You can actually see that in December, sort of at towards the end of the graph, the um, peak that of interpersonal violence in the December holiday period, often fueled by alcohol and drugs. Actually got two minutes policy, left. Thank you. Therefore, policy needs to recognize that crimes are responsive to police. Uh, sorry. Therefore, policy needs to recognize what crimes are responsive to policing and which are more responsive to a strong multidisciplinary partnerships, often as what you would probably hear over the next two days in terms of gender-based violence and many violence-related um, crimes. The different areas in the country also have different um, drivers for violence. So this again comes from January to March crime statistics um, released by the police, their presentations that show um, different drivers for crime as identified through motives that could be established in cases. Now here, unfortunately, in most cases, motives can't be established, but where motives were established, we saw almost 40% caused by misunderstandings and arguments, often between relatives and acquaintances, followed by 19% um, of murders in the commencement of robberies, followed by vigilantism, often fueled by the frustration of living in high crime communities, which um, rests around 15% of these murders, um, followed by murders in gangs, taxi conflict, illicit mining, and such, and revenge-related murders, making up 23%. So when we count those group-type gang violence, taxi conflict murders, together with the robbery, Figures, we saw 57% of the murders where causes could be established relating to organized crime and intergroup violence. These things happen across precincts, cities, provinces, and sometimes national boundaries and needs different organized crime type of approaches and policy at each tier. This coordination needs dedicated personnel, often what worked in the past through murder and robbery um, units and such. But it shows that you need different policies for different types of drivers. Furthermore, and this is sort of the last slide, a large proportion of murders aggravated and aggravated robbery occurs in predictable places and times. For example, most murders take place over weekends. The map represents the location of 30 policing precincts that recorded the highest number of murders during 1 January and March this year. These 30 stations make up only 2.6% of police stations, but accounted for 22.5% of all murders during this, process, uh, this period. These are located mainly within larger metros and in high volume uh, violence areas and uh, occur mostly over weekends and in identifiable hotspots. 
It is important, therefore, to understand what the hotspots are in metros, municipalities, district levels, to enable a comprehensive response. Focus policing, guided by accurate crime stats, can reduce harm that where it is most common. The police may be able to, produce, to reduce crime by visiting hotspots at the times that they are hotspots, trying to identify the people that are there, often repeat offenders in, for instance, for street robberies, and understand the modus operandi, the behavior of people in those, and see what the problems are, if there are more lights needed, if it's overgrown, work together with the authorities in order to um, impact these areas. Therefore, crime stats is a tool that if used well, will identify where a problem is the largest for certain crimes, um, bearing in mind under reporting rates. And of course, it can be used with other data such as health and medical um, health care and injury data. It's also an analytical tool that shows where hotspots are, especially when you have access to the point data, and then to work with partners to address the problems. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lizette. If you can unshare your screen for me, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Lizette. Also, I think followed on really nicely from what Matotsi had to say. Uh, next speaker in the session is Professor Shanaz Matthews, who's the director of the Children's Institute. She's going to be speaking on lessons from impl implementation science. So, Shanaz, I see you starting to share your screen. We can see it if you just want to start the slideshow. Fantastic. Thanks. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I've got a bit of a sinusitis, so bear with me if I start coughing. Um, it really pleased that you've put me in this spot, Guy, because I think it will follow very neatly from what Matotsi had presented and similarly what um, Lizette has been presenting as well. And, and I think one of the things that I'm taking out of Lizette's presentation is certainly, you know, that understanding um, our data on crime will certainly be able to also tell us better about where we need to target and what we need to be doing. So I wanted to talk a little bit about lessons from implementation science. Guy, you've given us eight minutes, so it's not much, and I'm really going to touch on a few things, and, and I'm hoping that, that it would give us some um, basis for discussion. And now my presentation's not moving. Mm. Okay. There we go. I start off by, by saying that, you know, um, over the past decade or more, there's been a lot of emphasis on developing an evidence base. And Matotsi also spoke about an evidence base on what works to prevent violence. We've got the INSPIRE framework, the RESPECT framework, and within the National Strategic Plan um, on to end gender-based violence, we also have a set of programs that have been uh, promoted in order to be implemented to, end, uh, to reduce and prevent violence. But I think it's really important from my perspective, and I'm wanting to draw on the work that I've currently been doing over the past two years or so, looking particularly at um, interventions and starting to understand what interventions are working in, in different contexts, particularly within the region. And with all these, the research base that have been developed, the goal is really to see what interventions should be scaled or programs should be scaled, integrated into practice in order for us to reduce violence or prevent violence before it starts. But I want to talk about the implementation gap today because I think, you know, we very, and, and Matotsi also spoke about the different forms of research and what research is seen as the best evidence. Um, and I'm wanting to raise a question around what we are learning about from research and whether in fact that research then can make a difference in real world practice. So, so I wanted to raise some of those questions this morning. So if you're thinking about implementation science, implementation science recognizes that in interventions or programs 
doesn't just happen and it's not just implemented. Interventions depend on context and what is meant by uh, so, so if you're thinking about an intervention, it, it's also, so if you're talking about a, an RCT or a program evaluation shows that the program is successful, the intervention has been implemented by, by practitioners. It has been delivered in a particular way and this delivery platform, there are certain components to the program. And therefore it also has a setting, a context in which it's implemented. And it's also implemented within a broader ecological system, meaning that there a setting that you've got to take into account and the policy environment and the context, the population that you, you're engaging with, whether it's a very high level of violence or not. And therefore, all of these are really, really important to consider when a program is implemented. And therefore, it's not a straightforward um, exercise of implementing a program that have shown to be successful in a particular context, because there is there are various factors that one has to consider about and whether the program can be implemented or adapted for a particular setting. So evidence, the research on what is effective certainly helps us select what to implement and for what to implement in a particular setting. But the evidence on its own is not enough because we've got to be considering what are the outcomes that you want and how to implement the program or particular practice. And what I mean by that is, so if you're thinking about the service to, um, the science to, and the other research to a service gap or implementation gap, what is known to be effective is not always what is adopted. And we've seen that over and over again. And what is effective in one particular context might not be effective in another. And therefore the implementation gap is really, really critical because there's no clear pathways to implementation. One of the areas that's a big challenge is implementing a program with fidelity to have the same good effects. And what I mean by this is, so for instance, in a research project, you, often these studies are well-funded. You have the personnel to implement in a very defined way. In the real world, that often doesn't happen. And therefore the same effect isn't always possible. And whether we measure that, um, I'm putting, that out for discussion as well, because often you're saying you're implementing a program that's shown good effect, but the question is whether in fact it is, whether there is a monitoring of the implementation as well, and to see whether the same effect is being achieved. And therefore what we're also seeing is that if the same staff is not implementing or training hasn't happened in a particular way, that the, um, the gains of a particular program will disappear over time. And therefore, when we can talk about implementation, we've got to be thinking about implementation as a set of activities designed to put into practice the whole program. And there are different dimensions to it. It's purposeful and it's an active process. And what I want to talk about further also is the core components that's necessary for the implementation of a particular program. So if we're thinking about implementing, implementing evidence-based programs, you've got to be asking, so what the what? What is it you, you're implementing? How are you implementing? And who is implementing it? And an easy example, so let's take a cake. If you make a cake, you know what the ingredients are. You know what the methods are to bake that cake in order to get the same result every time. But what we are finding is that often what you see in programs is that there is a program that's being advocated to be implemented, but not all the actual core components is well understood if the program is implemented in another context. Neither is there an adaptation process of thinking about what do we need to be thinking about differently in particular contexts. And having done reviews of programs, it's really, really interesting that very few programs in detail discuss and document all these 
elements for a program to be successful in different contexts. And therefore, it makes it incredibly difficult. And therefore, RCTs and the next step from an RCT certainly should be process evaluations and being able to understand what are the core components of programs that's making the difference and how and what should not be um, changed when you implement it in different settings. We have about two minutes left, Janaz. Okay, I'm nearly done. So if we're thinking about evidence-based programs, it is therefore the collection of practices, what needs to be done within known parameters. And therefore, you've got to be thinking about what are the treatment components? What are your service delivery structures? while also being able to understand evidence-based practices. So th this will then be your common elements of your program that needs to be implemented in a particular way. The other important area that we've got to be thinking about is what is the dose response? So if a program is designed as a 15 um, session program, a 10 session program won't have the same effect and therefore watering it down will not have the same effect. And therefore implementation definitely matters in getting the same outcomes. So the what, the intervention on its own is not effective. It is a combination of the implementation of the what as well as the implementation of the how that will give us the actual benefits because what you're trying to do is not to have poor outcomes or to have harm to populations you are implementing a program in. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shanaz. And uh, if you can just, yeah, thanks for sharing your screen. So we've had three speakers. We've got one more speaker left in the session. We have Lilia Mashela from the Civilian Secretariat for Peace Services, who is uh, an example of a government official who needs to take all this evidence into account and uh, be involved in processes of designing policy and legislation. So Lillian has a very difficult job. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Lillian. Uh, Lillian, you've got... Uh, uh, eight minutes maximum to make your presentation and then we'll open it up for discussion in the panel and then open beyond that to the actual other participants in the room to make comments or, or questions. So uh, over to you Lillian. Okay, thank you Guy. Um, I don't know if colleagues can see the screen. You can, um, if you can just start your slideshow so we get it maximizing the screen. Yes, okay. Uh, oh my goodness, now that's just blocked the bottom of, bottom of Bottom of your screen, um, where it's got the sort of like uh, screen, like the old school. Um, yeah. It's not okay, wait, let's see if we can it's, do this. It's fine. Uh, maybe we can still see your slides. So maybe just start with the first slide and click through them. That's fine. Yeah. All right. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Uh, otherwise, wait, there we go. Uh, there we go. Try that. There we go. Um, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. So eight minutes. Great. Um, I must thank the previous speakers. Um, it does make my uh, presentation, I don't know if it makes it easier or a little more difficult. I uh, will be speaking in the context of the 2016 white paper on safety and security and its extension or the strategy, the integrated crime and violence prevention strategy. So in terms of what's already been said um, that I really must appreciate is that we've already looked at how uh, policy and policymaking needs to be appreciative of the context that it wishes to influence and the issues that it seeks to solve, which um, Matozi spoke to, and the different factors or the different elements that can contribute and constitute evidence. So when when we we were in the drafting of the integrated crime and violence prevention strategy, this was a, a particular critical factor that there needs to be uh, a. a disparate um, body of knowledge that informs the development of an integrated crime and violence prevention strategy with the appreciation, as Lizette had said, that policy needs to realize the different drivers of crime. Um, Shanaz also touched on, 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 on you know, um, the data on crime and the distinction really for me what came out was that there needs to be a clear distinction on not just crime, but the distinction between crime and violence, which then brings in those elements of um, having to understand the other socio, um, or social factors or socioeconomic factors that contribute to crime. Because what we need to know as is, is what actually exists in crime and violence prevention strategy. So you may know, or colleagues may know that in the drafting of the integrated crime and violence prevention strategy, or back then they 
white paper on safety and security, it was actually based on the um, review of the National Crime and Prevention Strategy, as well as the 1998 White Paper on Safety and Security, which then led to the realization, having looked at the body of knowledge and through different consultation, and I think this is the key area of my presentation, is that um, multiple layers and multiple stakeholders need to participate in, 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 in policy making when we speak of evidence, because we cannot be experts in every area, particularly for this um, sector in terms of crime and violence prevention. It's not just about policing. It's not just about health. It's not just about social development. There are different layers and there's an appreciation even so in the white paper for, for um, the multiple role players and the factors that contribute to the risk for um, crime and violence. And so there needs to be a creation of a body of knowledge and, and an extensive, um, look at me not moving my slides, contribution in terms of data. So as I've spoken to in policymaking, the complex, the appreciation for the complex interplay of socioeconomic factors in South Africa really required that there must be a directed policy that addresses not one layer, but a range of systemic factors. And so developing, um, and Shanaz touched, has touched on it briefly, but developing targeted policy interventions means that we need data that is time, timely, that is quality data, it needs to be reliable and um, must be verified. Um, and this must be sourced from a wide range of stakeholders. And this is the appreciation that I think in the development of the ICVP as the Integrated Crime and Violence Prevention Strategy really was highlighted for me in that we needed to pull in and, and ensure that the data is rich and that consultations generate um, deeper um, uh, content development or knowledge development. And because the wider and deeper that consultation processes are, then the richer the information that we got, which supports better evidence-based decisions. Um, and so information obviously would then need to be sifted through, would need to be analyzed and synthesized to inform policy making processes. But I think the key thing is to ensure um, that data is of course legitimate, that it's it, um, relevant and is broadly representative of the context in which it seeks to remedy. Um, so this meant that we needed to tap, tap into a, a range of data sources um, that, were requ that required embedding a multi-layer approach to encouraging active and two-way exchange of data and information, but also appreciating that you, uh, and this is how we then cascaded it down from a national level as policy developers to the very um, lowest of local level at implementation level, where you needed to speak to people who know what they are talking about. And so the challenge was also appreciating that there are different contexts, even within the broader South African context. And so generating insights and developing so solutions from the multiple layers of data, the multiple contributors of data and information was central to really um, evidence-based decision-making. So these insights also further serve to um, see as a constant feedback loop to inform the not only the policy making process, but also the implementation process. There's constantly going to be a large generation of, uh, of data that we would need to sift through to contribute into the wider ecosystem that facilitates ongoing learning and um, ideation and testing of different policy options. And I think this is probably more relevant at implementation level where there needs to be ongoing learning. And I think there was, um, I can't remember which one of the previous speakers spoke about um, the appreciation of the uniqueness of the different contexts and learning, even if it's not relevant to a particular or the next context. And that's why testing may become important or piloting, but piloting, piloting comes with lessons that we learn, but we also need to contextualize for different societies and different environments. Um, so evidence contained or obtained through the feedback loop further creates conditions for more agile responses to a constantly evolving public safety landscape. And I think there's also the appreciation that this um, crime and violence dynamics or landscape is continuously, um, is, is dynamic rather and continu requires continued adaptation. So through a multi-layered approach, um, relevant data and information uh, can be, um, um, 
requires desegregation to align crime reduction strategies with individual community contexts. So it's really, I think, in essence, um, for this presentation, the appreciation that contexts differ. And so the evidence for the different contexts needs to be aligned and, and, and um, adapted to different situations when we get to the level of implementation. It needs to, of course, we've spoken to it being timely and accurate and reliable and inform and the informa information must facilitate the, the, the development of holistic policy interventions. The thing or the key thing to appreciate also is that this is not just about policy making, but it's about ensuring that the programs and the interventions that come from these policies um, do not result in, 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 in wasteful um, expenditure, because this is also about public spending and the spending of public funds. So in order for um, for data and information to be considered evidence, I think it must be structured and analyzed in a meaningful way, such that it generates insights into the problem. And these are really some of the uh, contributors to what the um, white paper on safety and security, the 2016 white paper uh, on safety and security advocates for, because it also speaks to uh, ensuring that interventions and programs are based and on, on demonstrated and proven results. And I think the previous speaker has also spoken to that, but the availability of data is critical. Um, so how do we, at, at, at a policy I'm making about level- minutes left, Lillian. Oh, okay. Uh, how do we ensure that we, we, we continue to feed into this loop of, 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 of knowledge creation and, and data management so that we share it? The white paper also makes a proposal for a center where data can be brought in and the same data, um, this center to be housed at, 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 at the presidency that can assist with generating, but also the disaggregation of data. So in order for data and information to be considered Okay, I've spoken to the slide, but I also, um, as I was thinking about it, I said, so what would be the recommendation in terms of policy making? Um, and as, as I was doing some reading, and I think it's critical that perhaps as policymakers, we started moving into an area where we explore integrating innovative technologies. Excuse me. In, 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 in decision making for, 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 for policy um, development? How do we use technology such that it informs future policy and perhaps have predictive analytics or analysis that can inform or predict future behavior such that policies can begin to already correct in the development process, we begin to start thinking about how do we correct future unintended consequences based on data that's been received. It would be current trends, but also based on historical data that can assist in improving and predicting future behavior. So to get, I think the crucial thing with the development of the integrated crime and violence prevention strategy was the collaboration and the, that whole of society and whole of government approach. And by whole of society, I mean, with the inclusion, and we've done this in consultations, and I don't know if there's ever enough consultation, to be honest, um, where civil society is included, where academia is brought into the picture, where NGOs and, 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 and traditional leaders are brought into a picture because the stronger focus or, or is needed in, in, in institutionalizing, institutionalizing firstly a bottom-up approach to policy making through stakeholder engagement processes, but also um, through strengthened and institutionalized mechanisms, structured or unstructured, for, for um, shared learning and for shared knowledge creation between stakeholders, particularly in the sector, who know the problems that exist within the different contexts um, that policy seeks to remedy. Um, and I hope I've captured that in eight minutes, but we'll carry over the discussion in, 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 in the engagements. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just checking. I'm online. Yes, I am. Thank you so much, Lily. You were exactly eight minutes and you covered a lot of territory there as well. Thanks to all our full speakers. Um, thank you, Pat, and a really accessible, really interesting and insightful presentation. So I think we've got a lot of material for comments and, dis and discussion going forward and certainly for the rest of the session. Um, so as I explained to everyone in the room at the beginning, is that we are going to just allow a bit of engagement between the panelists and then after that we're going to open it up for comments and questions i see some comments have been and questions have been posed in the chat already but maybe just reflecting on um uh, what the presenters have said um, i'd like to encourage them to 
uh, respond to maybe some of the other panelist members, but also I just pulled together a slide very quickly, and if you just bear with me whilst I share my screen, um, of some possibilities of issues to address. Let me just make that. Um, of some of the, the points that jumped out of the various presentations. And um, also I've engaged in, in uh, evidence-led, um, evidence-informed uh, implementation science approaches as well. So it's just some, some sort of thoughts I had as well, but this is largely derived from what the presenters have said. So, and uh, Shanaz mentioned it, also we had with Matotsi mentioning it, it's the nature of research method. And you know, Matotsi was referring to um, random controlled trials and other types of, of, of methods that are used to generate data. And of course, some methods are more robust than others. So of course, their findings from a random controlled trial might be more robust than someone who did a very low level type of study where they went and asked, conducted a few interviews of key informants. Um, so I think the kind of question is, if I can ask the panelists just to reflect on research method and around the importance thereof, because I think often in contexts where you'll have uh, individuals saying, well, it's, we're basing this on evidence, but the, the evidence is actually a very small study and it might not be representative. So it's about the, the, the kind of the understanding of research method and how do we promote the importance of research method and understanding evidence. And the second one would be the applicability of evidence from other countries or contexts. So of course, um, it's been mentioned by the presenters here, but often you'll get evidence from Northern context, Western European contexts, some other African countries, which might be very different to South Africa. So maybe if the presenters can reflect on that and you know, how do you deal with this, this issue sometimes when you don't have evidence from your own country and you've got good evidence from other places, how do you, you kind of uh, make, make sense of that? Then of course, there is the ideological, political and cultural preferences around uh, certain evidence-based uh, interventions that might be promoted, but they clash with certain preferences. And I think Shanaz and others can, can kind of have a lot of experience around this in relation to the use of corporal punishment in schools and in the home and a, um, a lot of uh, kind of concerns and public opposition to something like that. I mean, we're seeing this happening within the context of the proposed amendments to the Firearms Control Act. Um, you know, where evidence suggests one thing, but, you know, kind of there are preferences against that, for example. Um, we're seeing this playing out. Also, obviously, public opinion consultations and lobbying play quite an important role within uh, evidence based as well. And then, of course, we, we have a, an issue within South Africa where we pursue a number of pilot projects, but we don't seem to be able to move from pilot to large scale. So those are just sort of a few things that I picked up uh, from the presentations, but also wanted to throw into the mix. So if I'd like to encourage our panelists to, to kind of make certain points, respond to this, respond to others. Um, but I'm not going to give you any particular order. So maybe those who want to start, if you can put up your hand um, and then we can take it from there. Uh, Lizette, over to you. I'll, I'll bravely ve venture into this first um, <laughs> bit, because uh, my colleagues, of course, have given us a lot of food for thought. And I think it is just incredible how complex, as Lillian has pointed out, how complex and how, how, how much we need relationships. We need partnerships in all of this. What always strikes me of the crime statistics is that whatever we're doing is not working. We know that daily when we look at the news and when we see the issues happening, we see a lot of problems. We have an amazing white paper. There's a lot of really good um, legislation on the table and such. But what is sorely lacking here is this level of partnership. Um, and a sharing of this information. So a data center, for instance, cannot come um, quicker. Um, the sharing where we sit at these platforms together and have these discussions need to be more regular. We need to work with the civilian secretariat. We need to work with the police, the NPA, and Department of Justice and others as civil society far closer in order to really understand what needs to be happening. But there needs to be honestly just an openness to work together, that it's not belonging to some body or some organization. 
And that's what is so exciting if we can get this um, white paper off the ground is the fact that such a data center with, with these partnerships will really start addressing local level type of drivers, problems, modus operandi and such. But we need to start understanding too that the problem is larger than what we see it as being because we haven't touched we are very limited in our approaches we're very limited in our capacity we haven't even touched on the real issues that that people and communities fear that's why that bottom-up approach is so important most notably for instance street robberies making up the largest proportion of aggravated robberies. This is what plagues and dry, um, communities and drives vigilantism, for instance. And what we often have, unfortunately, in this country is those lobby groups with the biggest budgets, the most uh, um, presence on social media, making the most impact as to what they believe should be prioritized. And what we are seeing is that communities that really need to be prioritized, policies that really need to be prioritized, it's not being prioritized. So people are suffering every day and, and it's eroding trust in all of us, government, um, you know, civil society, all of us alike because people feel alone and vulnerable. So, I mean, I can talk about research methods because that can add to that um, vulnerability quite substantively if we do not use the correct research methods. The one thing I think that has been lacking to some extent, and, and I mean, you know, thankfully, I know the colleagues on this panel has been exceptional, but we always have to look at whatever we do, whether we are abiding to research ethics standards and whether we are putting our communities first and not leaving them with more trauma than what we found them and i think those are there's just so much to discuss guy and i'm just so grateful to to be able to learn in the next two days thank you thanks so much lizette i see there's a hand coming from the floor if you could just hold on your hand we'll keep you in the queuing system we're just going to allow the panelists to um to respond so um i see uh, we will give you an opportunity. I've got Matutsi next, and then I've got um, Shinaz after Matutsi. So Martin, just hold hold on to your hand. Um, we'll, we'll come back to you when we open up. So Matutsi, over to you. Uh, thanks, Guy, and uh, thanks for those thoughts uh, to reflect on. Um, I wanted to start off on this question and sort of pick off from where uh, Lizette ended off on this issue around methods. Because I think I think it's true. I mean, different methods give us um, different levels of rigor and, and and certainty and robustness in terms of our of our inquiry and our analysis. But what's also I think becoming clear is that in addition to thinking about methods, we also have to be thinking about the the sort of the social justice aspect of research. Um, and also we need to be thinking about how research frames the problem. So methods is one thing, but, but we have to look at what kind of questions are we asking? What kind of uh, problematization are we, are we representing? And does that actually help society grapple with the nature of the problem and get a better handle and an understanding of what's really happening? And I think the point that um, uh, that Lizette mentioned about, for example, you know, uh, the issue with with street robbery is an important point because some things get missed. Some of the important things, some of the critical things that are happening in communities get missed, but sometimes they're also missed because of how, how researchers, we frame the problem. Because what we frame, what we focus on, what we study become what society is uh, sort of, you know, what, what captures the imagination, what people are focusing on and what policymakers are also focusing, uh, focusing on. So I will emphasize also really, really look in the way that we frame the problem, not just the kind of methods and, and uh, that are used in studying the, studying the problem. The other thing that I wanted to, to, to touch on, you know, we did, um, uh, um, we just finished a project which was published in 2020, which was looking at barriers and facilitators to evidence use that was looking at um, eight case studies in different African countries. And so it was done with, with clear AA. And what was interesting was that we used a framework that looked at evidence 
evidence used as behavior change. So meaning that you need to be thinking about how we want people to act differently. And when you say people acting differently, not talking just about um, policymakers, because usually that's what we think. Okay, we need the likes of Lillian to to get access to the to the to the evidence to be able to use it and 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 stuff like that. But actually, it's not just the policymakers. It is also how researchers act. It's also how people who are analyzing data act in the analysis of uh, of, of of data. And then also, <clears throat> excuse me. And then also, we need to be thinking quite intentionally about what are these use interventions that we are using. So, Lillian, for example, you talked about um, uh, a center, and a center will be very very helpful. But at the same time, it is not necessarily the absence of 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 information being collated as much as that's still weak that the information is not being used there are still some things that we are missing and one of the 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 tools or one of the the process that we need to, to be to be thinking about is this idea that knowledge has to be to be brokered it has to be an active process of bringing information to bear otherwise what happens is that we do get in, you know, we do invest resources in establishing institutions, in establishing tools, but it doesn't actually lead to change in the way that interventions are being designed or in the way that policies are being um, are being uh, framed. Thanks, Matotsi. Shanaz, you're next. <clears throat> yeah, um, I think Matotsi, what Matotsi has been talking about is very powerful because I think one of the things that you know, uh, I'm obviously coming at this from a research hat because I'm, I'm based at a research institution. And, and you probably get, and for me, data is really, really important. And the rigor behind data collection becomes incredibly important. But I do think one of the things we're not doing enough of um, on is, and, and this is what Matotsi has been talking about is, what are our research questions? And if we're wanting to move the area around safety and violence forward, community engagement approaches are fundamentally important. Because yes, it's important to be able to map out and document where your hotspots are and understanding that, but to fundamentally change people, you know, our community's experiences of violence, there needs to be a two-way process. It can't just be researchers swooning in and policymakers swooning in. We've got to be engaging with our communities to start changing and getting partnerships. And I think um, both Lizette and Matotsi spoke about partnerships because if we're wanting to prevent violence or pre improve safety, those partnerships are critical. Um, and therefore, it becomes really important that it's thinking about how we do this well and we do it correctly because we've. I think you know we're not even near being able to engage with our communities in a way where we're meaningfully making differences. The other important thing is about evidence, and this is very related to research. Over the past decade or so, we've been, and, and this is the thing about what research methods are giving us the best results. And I think that it should be a combination of methods and not just one, because what, what we're learning from RCTs is one thing about what's working in a very um, contained environment. But I also think it's important for, for us to understand what's happening in the real world, in real context. And therefore, that leap between very controlled environments to supporting your um, NGOs and working in partnership with community-based organizations becomes critically important. And I think for us as researchers sitting in academic institutions, there should be increased partnerships. So this idea about leaping from pilots to large scale also requires not just those partnerships, but also this the ability, because most of, if you're thinking about what is being funded and where the funding's coming from for programs, it's largely from outside donor agencies. And if 
South Africa wants to make meaningful change, there needs to be partnerships beyond just, and we've got to be thinking about how we um, fund those bigger, larger scale programs where it's not just controlled by government, but that there is a compact between business, between outside donors and between um, the government, because I, I, I truly feel the problems that we're facing at the moment requires investment in a totally different way. And we need to be thinking of our programs at much larger scale than what we're implementing. So my initial comments, Guy. Thanks so much, Shanaz. Uh, Lillian, is there something you would like to comment on? Mm. We just muted over there. <laughs> there we go. Yes, thank you, Guy. Um, so without over echoing what the panelists have said, um, I think there's um, two things that really jump out for me. Firstly, the importance of collaboration, which I cannot overemphasize, um, but also coordination and um, effective coordination mechanisms. So when we speak, be it about, Matozzi alluded to the center, yes, it may be necessary, it may be relevant, but if we don't coordinate it correctly, then that data will not be useful in terms of policymaking or interventions or program development. But the other thing in terms of um, collaboration that uh, I actually wanted to speak to, and I'm, I'm glad Shanaz captured it in terms of the inclusion of communities. Um, because a lot of these um, issues that we seek to address, challenges we seek to address, are, are laying at the level of communities. And, and I want to go back to um, an experience when we were drafting a policy on reducing barriers to reporting gender-based violence and, and, and sexual offenses. What we realized there is that the context within the South African context, there are many contexts and, and, and different societies and different communities. So some of the, um, as we were doing some of our um, evidence collection and some of our research, you realize that firstly, I think it's always been a realization that solutions cannot be a one size fits all um, kind of uh, response. To, to crime and violence. There's work being done by a number of bodies within policing. There's the evidence-based policing committees. There's um, VPUU that's doing great work in terms of working within um, certain communities and they're building knowledge there uh, and implementing. And I think we need to begin to appreciate and draw from that data and find ways. And, and, and when I made reference to the barriers policies, you found that there are people who have police stations, but they, are, they and they have all the resources and they have vehicles, but there's no consideration on the roads on which these uh, vans need to travel on. And so we still do not address the issues because when you sit at national and you draft a policy and you say they must have 10 vans, they can have 10 vans, but if they are inadequate roads to, to get these vans to the people whom they are meant to service, then there's no point. So I think collaboration and understanding, and I've alluded to it before in terms of having people who know what's going on on the ground contribute to, to, to um, uh, policy making and the creation of evidence and 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 also I guess within the re, um, research context is crucial to ensuring that we have successful and implementable policies and programs and interventions. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much Lillian and thanks to our panelists for responding. I want to now take this opportunity to open it up to everyone else in this particular call. We've got uh, just under an hour for people to, to ask questions or make comments, but it was just a final comment from my side, just listening to, to panelists and the kind of need for partnership. I think there's also a need for partnership amongst uh, researchers and academics and scholars out there, because often we're not very good at sharing our data. Um, so as I know we've encountered, a number of us have encountered that when we're trying to do studies and want to access data, um, and uh, certain individuals are unwilling to share it, but that's just a minor issue. So yes, the opportunity now is for those uh, 85 of us in this room, if you'd like to pose questions, what I want to do is to just collect a few questions or comments and then give the uh, panel an opportunity to respond to those questions and then we'll open it up again. So I see a hand from Martin Seicholt, excuse me if my, I mispronounce your surname Martin, um, and others if you can please just use the raise the hand function. If you're having problems with the raise the hand function, I know some browsers you don't get it. Um, if you can just go to the chat and type a question in the chat so then I know that you're looking to ask a question. So Martin, over to you. 
If you can just introduce yourself as well, please. Mark. Yeah, good morning. My name is Martin Zwiefeld. I'm uh, uh, the Director for Policy and Research in the um, Provincial Department, the Provincial Secretariat for, for Safety in the Eastern Cape. And so the, the, the kind of issues I want to raise are from the perspective of, of that, the provincial kind of safety, um, or basically provincial oversighting and, 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 and research within the, within the Secretariat. So some of the questions I have, I mean, just to start at the methodological level, I think, you know, we, 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 we ran the risk of, of kind of sort of jumping into a kind of a populist methodological kind of, um, you know, whole of society, whole of methodology and everything kind of um, approach to things when approaches are very distinctive. So, for example, the work that Andrew Ford does on, on the policing um, is linked to um, basically how very local level, almost unspoken coalitions of of, of, of communities and police negotiate policing as very particular kind of outcomes. And that's very diff different to kind of imposing a, a procedural justice model on how to establish trust between um, communities and police from a more positivistic type of approach to um, to measuring trust, you know, because the one is interpretivist and the other one is kind of more objectivist, positivist. And so I think, what really does need to happen is that a lot of the debate and a lot of our discussion, a lot of our research needs to move into a much higher level. It needs to be ratcheted up into a much more competent area of engagement because subjective, I mean, preferences and, 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 and decisions on, on research methodology have immense um, consequences, um, you know, and as I've already mentioned. And I think one of the, one of the questions um, on, um, on on why pilots don't get ramped up, I think is answered by by that kind of context as well. And that is that, um, yeah, I think Lillian um, um, kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, local area solutions are exactly what is required. I think the large scale blueprints that some donor agencies try and promote and continuously try and promote blueprints kind of fail all the time. And we must realize that we must actually create far more kind of smaller um, entry points rather than trying to ramp everything up because ramping everything up can, can, can kind of destroy it. We must also not forget the cargo cult um, effect of, of donor programs. They sometimes create successes during the period of the, of the donor program. And then when, when they come to an end, they tend to fail. And we don't take cognizance of these things. And I think we need to be much more critical about assessing why things work and why they don't work. We need to be like really kind of honest about them. Now, in the context of, um, you know, crime data, I think I, I really must applaud Lizette's work on, on, on crime stats and all that. Um, but, you know, crime stats are also very political. So the way in which they're interpreted within a political department can sometimes be... Um, a conflictual issue. The MEC wants to present the best side of the crime stats, and yet you want to present the most critical side of the crime stats. And then how do you how do you reconcile those because you're actually almost pushed into trying to to justify the kind of political interpretation with the methodological and the real understanding of it and the analysis. And I think for that reason, we need to create a, a relative autonomy for analysis. Absolutely. And I don't know whether this national crime statistics um, or crime center is the answer. Because for me, I mean, the white paper itself is about localizing. It's about kind of um, decentralizing um, initiatives to local government level. And I think that's where analysis needs to be. I don't think that centralized, and I've seen, I've seen this mistake made so often that centralized power put research in there and then what you actually do over time is you actually detach from your local context. I think we need to create far more um, um, partnerships of people who are on the ground, who know what they're doing in the provinces, because we need to have a rapid response type of research environment for engaging in, in how things are, are, are going. So for me to centralize, we, we're going to lose it. That's my, my feeling. We also have so much capability. I mean, you take the Eastern Cape, for example. What have they got going for it? Well, they've got the universities. Why aren't we using universities at a very local, regional level to actually create that kind of a, a research um, 
environment, an evidence generating environment, whereas where universities actually become or compensate even in the Eastern Cape for the fact that we don't have NGOs in parts of the province, okay, where we need partners and use different models of how to how to go about that. Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of other things that I still wanted to say, but um, let me, let me, what, what, one of the last things I wanted to say is that, okay, the role of the secretariat, okay, now I know I might get myself fired here, but I think there's not enough work being done there. We, we, we need to, I mean, the secretariat is at the heart of crime and crime stats, but we're never putting out any level of analysis any level of understanding of, of crime statistics. Instead, we leave, we leave it to others. If we took over some of the role of, of crime stats to create a first level of, of, of quality assurance or, or processing, then agencies like the ISS could get actually involved in more focused, more sophisticated areas of, of, of analysis. The, 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 the Secretariat also has a very localized presence in all the province, and I don't know why we aren't using the, the Secretariat to create much more of an, a, a first layer of analysis on, 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 on crime stats, because I think that's that's really what, what, what is needed. The other thing that the Secretariat has, it's got um, regulated access to data of stats. There were some questions about using um, SAP's data for um, feeding into policy, and absolutely that needs to happen. In my in my four five years of of working in SAPs now, in, well, in that environment, um, in, in 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 the secretariat at the police uh, in, the, in the provincial level, I've just realised what a wealth of data is in 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 in, in the SAPs environment, but it's kind of caught up in 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 in, in access. Uh, problems and and we've been trying to to kind of to, to get over that so for example we we've conducted a study on gender-based violence where we wanted to collect all of the the the, the levels all of the indicators of all the um the the dma books on on on, on gender-based violence from all the police stations and then to try and model um the levels of existing gender-based violence um and 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 sort of estimate um, in, in, inadequate reporting in certain areas and then come up with a, a more realistic figure of, of the impact of gender-based violence. But there's, there's certain kind of um, weaknesses in how stats are managed within SAPs. And maybe one can, can look at not only managing stats, stats for, for, for crime purposes, but also for feeding into the policy process. I think that's one area that we, we definitely need to, to look into. And um, I mean, as we were analyzing the gender-based violence stats, it became, it became evident that, um, for example, there was intergenerational um, 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 violence that was increasing within the domestic sphere. And we started realizing that this was actually linked ultimately to the emergence of gangsterism in rural areas. And so that's been a whole another layer of, of, of research. So okay, I'm, I'm rambling here a bit, but I think I've said some of my, my key, um, <laughs> key issues that I wanted to raise. I, I think, you know, methodology is so critical. I think we need to become much more serious about researching and, and less populist in our approach to crime stats and, and crime analysis. Um, it's, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Martin. That was a really, really helpful response, very detailed. Um, it's always good to get that kind of analysis um, and also kind of give us, give us a bit more insight into, in terms of your kind of job. So thank you so much for that. I've got a hand up from Charmaine Sutil. Excuse my pronunciation of your surname. Uh, Charmaine, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, and you got my surname right, Charmaine Sutil, um, City of Chwani, Chwani Metro Police. Um, I just linking up to what um, some of the speakers have said, I think in terms of a local planning perspective, um, crime statistics do not align with ward level planning. So when you have a project, for instance, in the city of Chwani, um, we implemented the safety promotion through urban upgrading program in Mama Lodi East, which was co-funded by the German bank. And it's difficult to assess the success of the program, um, you know, it focused on youth development centers, pedestrian walkways, um, community facilities, and so forth. Because if you just look at the crime stats for Mama Lodi East, um, they've been increasing as relates to murder and so forth. 
So you can't get the statistics for specific wards where interventions have been implemented. Um, I think the other point is also the costs for local government when it comes to um, research and getting evidence for our programs. It can be quite costly and local government is facing a lot of resource constraints. Um, and then the other point is also the competing demand um, made by various wards relating to crime, such as the growing number of gated communities in our city. And this is done in terms of provincial legislation. It will have long-term implications in terms of spatial planning, as well as um, inequality in the city. However, gated communities have the evidence that crime stats have come down. So you have all these different competing discourses, but very much um, planning and research needs to be on a local level, um, ideally even on a ward level, to allow for proper planning and monitoring. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very useful comments as well. Um, are there any comments or questions? I don't see, I see some people making comments within the chat function supporting what has been said. I don't see any specific questions being raised. Um, are there any other comments or questions people would like to raise their hands? I don't see any hands at the moment, so maybe if I can hand back to the panel members if they want to respond to the questions and comments that have been made so far. Um, so it's any Shanaz, Lillian, Lizette, Lizette um, Matotsi, were there any, any of those comments or questions you'd like to respond to? I did see that you did make comments within the, the chat about them, but if you'd like to expand on those, now is the opportunity. Lillian, I see you're ready to go. I was here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just actually can't find the hand icon on, on my fine. PC. Fine. Um, but um, I just wanted to add to what I think Martin had said, except now I just lost my trail of thought. Um, <laughs> if another speaker can go and then it will come back to me because I felt it was um, important to speak to. Um, but the other thing, maybe if I can touch on it as well, in terms of the integrated crime and violence prevention strategy, there is a, an appreciation and an acknowledgement that we're going through some um, fiscal constraints as government. And so what I think or we need to start thinking about as well is also how we measure the impact or the effectiveness of interventions, because that will inform how we direct resources to, 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 to areas where there is impact and that it really does change the lives of the people on the ground. Um, that was just one thing I thought would be critical to mention in terms of starting to think about how we also measure the impact, even in drafting policy thought, think about how measurable it is and, and, and the impact or effect that it hopes to achieve. Um, but yeah, so let me leave it at that for now whilst I remember what I need to say. Thanks, Lillian. I do see there's uh, two hands from the from the from the greater uh, from the from from other participants, but I just want to give um, a Tutsi a chance to respond, and then I can open it up again for comments or questions. So, Matotsi, over to you. Um, and uh, Lizette, I see your camera's on. Are you looking to say something as well? Okay, so Matotsi and then Lizette, and then we can see if uh, open it up for other comments or questions. So, Matotsi, over to you. Okay, great. Uh, so, I think I just wanted to make two comments. One is that uh, when when we're dealing with a problem like violence, it's always important to keep in mind that we have to have a degree of humility about what we actually know about the problem because it is complex and there's so many dimensions to it. Even what we talk about, if you if you if you look at a lot of our literature, even at data, we often are looking at the direct violence. We're looking at what is observed, what can be, you know, what's observed, what's observable, what can be quantified, what can be measured. But there are many other things that underlie the problem that we're able to observe and what we're able to generate evidence on. And I think that, that that's something that's important for us to, to keep in mind. If we're talking about, for example, whether it's, uh, it's police data, whether it's even research, uh, uh, you know, knowledge that comes from research, 
there are so many other things, so many other drivers and so many connections between the drivers of violence that we don't always have a full handle on. That does not necessarily mean that we mustn't, um, we mustn't use what we know, but it's important to always remember that when we are responding to a complex problem, we must, we must, we must intervene and we must sense and we must understand if it's working or if it's not working, what needs to be adjusted and continuously be committed to adapting as we, um, as we go. The other thing that I wanted to, uh, to comment on is this issue about where, where should the knowledge be allocated? I think, I mean, so going back to the South African state, for example, and how it's structured, you know, you have different spheres of government and each sphere does something different that another sphere cannot do. It can implement or, or, or develop policies that another sphere cannot, uh, cannot do. And so you want the different spheres of government that work uh, you know, uh, cooperatively to have access to the best available um, knowledge that is applicable to their sphere of government and their ability to, to govern at their, uh, at their level. And so that means investing in knowledge generation in many different levels, but also investing in different types of knowledge that's being generated, both the sort of quantitative complex modeling, but also we need um, qualitative narrative to understand some of the complex dynamics that are driving violence in our communities that will not come out in some of the data that we, 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 we rely on to use um, to, to, make, uh, to make decisions. And lastly, and this is something that for me, it's, it's quite close uh, to the work that we have been doing in the Violence Prevention Forum in the ISS, is that we have to think about, particularly with research, and, because I mean, I think for, 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 for the kind of data that Lizette has been talking to, that data is being collected anyway. But for, for the kind of research, when we go into community, we design interventions, we, we, we ask people to give us this data, we collect it, but yet the, the benefit of that knowledge does not accrue back to those communities. We have to ask ourselves, is that a just thing to do? Is that a just thing to continue to invest in this? Even if the research itself is robust and is generating data and information that is robust, but is that just when the benefit does not translate to the improvement to the lives of the people that we continuously research? Thanks, Matotsi. Very important points there. Lizette, over to you. Um, thank you, Guy. It's partially sort of three of the, um, the contributors that I just want to respond to. And there was an earlier question by Glenn about, um, he wanted to know about the different spheres of government and how SAP's data can be used to plan and measure for their own um, uh, efforts. And that links to what Shomaine has been saying. You know, Mamelodi East, I remember doing um, sort of local level crime analysis for that area when the VP, when it started. And what you are complaining about, Charmaine, is something that I think underlies everything um, in this country. It is everything that ha we have been starting to talk about and everything we would like to talk about and everything we know we would like to do in terms of evidence-based research need some basic building blocks, hence me speaking about the crime stats. And Martin said it the best. He said, at a very basis, we need this information in our communities for, for use. And, and that's what Shemaine was basically saying. We don't have resources at a local level. None of us have exhaustive resources to just undertake all these studies and to collect information and stuff. But this information, the basic building block, namely some of the crime stats, should be available at a local level, should be at a ward level. And it is possible to, to model that once we have accurate census data, we've done it before. But at the very least, least at a station level that we can aggregate up to the municipalities we working really hard to do that so that municipalities have information about their very hot spots and their very crime situations at a municipal but also at a station and hotspot level but there must be a willingness by the police to also assist us in doing that for instance for mummy Lodi east in order to just have this basic building block and point data will be incredibly useful over time for certain crime categories such as murder and robbery. We've seen the successes 
uh, by um, and the research done by people like my colleagues Andrew Fall and such on on looking at local data. So you know this is everybody's data, and if we have it and none of us have to scavenge for it, and it's available at a local level, that's one thing done. Then it is about trying to get injury data, medical data, trying to see who are the NGOs working in areas. We can build these partnerships, but we have to have the basic building blocks. We can do really robust methodologies, ethical research, good research question, if we have the basic building blocks. So the question to me, or for me ultimately, is how do we get the basic building blocks in order to facilitate all this evidence-based research and, and programs that we need in this country. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lizette. I see uh, comments happening in the chat as well in relation to some of these comments. So if, uh, to refer everyone to that. Um, Shanaz, is there any contribution you'd like to make right now? If not, I'm gonna open it up for other comments or questions from the floor. No, I think you can open it up to the floor, Guy. Oh, great, and then just before I do that, Lillian, you, uh, were kind of trying to recall a point that you wanted to make. Is do you want to make that point now, or do you want to uh, hang on a bit? No, we can go ahead, guy. Thank you. Okay. All uh, right. Okay. I see one hand sitting in the queue at the moment. Um, Abdullah Hamed, if you'd like to ask your question or make your comment, over to you. And if you can just introduce yourself as well, please. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I can hear me. Okay, that's cool. Um, first of all, I would like to, because I don't know what's something in my mouth, but I don't know, <laughs> kind of see the picture maybe, but it's okay. Um, regarding the, the topic today, because I learned a lot about it, and uh, yeah, in South Africa, we are facing there's many challenges regarding of the violence. And this thing is not just came because of like, um, uh, there is no reason, but because there is many cases that we can, like, I can address regarding our day why you have got a violence in our community like that. So in this in this term regard, because you see the poverty is a play major roles. And the second thing that because the government should have uh, intervened by like the sustainable uh, solutions that where these young boys and young girls, they can find the jobs and those jobs maybe will be secure them for the time being. And also, we are we are going to know that I mean, the the economics, uh, historical family background, background that also play big roles. And the most important part is the the family restraint. That means the connection in the family. How we are going to raise up these kids and the responsibility of the of the parents. So in this in this manner that we 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 lack a lot of things that you can see because there are many young boys and young girls. They are just like without um i can say like how we can put that but um because like they lack maybe like single mom or like maybe like a single dad and it's gonna be i mean a huge challenge in that case so the kids can be losing moving around there so they they, they lose the guidance they lose the i mean they this i mean they're like the uh what you call i can put uh, the the ability in order to, to see themselves um and then they will come to the future by 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 the time they will they come to the future and then they they go to university and they build themselves without having like any inter, I mean interruptions or like difficulties and this kind of issue. So I can compare because my my family I mean, my, my family background that I came I came from Sudan and in Sudan also you have got like the huge number of like the violence but it's different than the South African one because in Sudan is you are not allowed to have a gun and you are not allowed to like. Uh, that means you cannot like um, that if, if you get commit crime that you call you will be sent to the to the to the jail and maybe for the death and here in South Africa we don't have this kind of the rules and that's one of the issues. So let us be talking about if I just can add a little bit about what is the solution, what is the best solution that I can add in this regard. The best solution is the government and intervenes and the community part because there are two parts thing that you can do because everything cannot be done by the government. No, even as we are the community in South Africa. We need to redefine uh, our roles and responsibility towards our country. Okay, how we cannot have a baby without having the good foundation of the family basis. So if you bring that somebody like that in the community, what is going to happen? Because you will end up by 
losing the getting in I mean, the good educations and it will be raising the good environment. So that is one case. And the second thing that we need also to look for the economic situations regarding those like our poor people, like for example, as you mentioned, the Mamolodi. Because Mamolodi, if you can see there, because there is the quiet number of the people that are living there, they are facing very serious life. So because of that serious life, because there is no like jobs, there is no good opportunity for them in order to, 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 to remove themselves from the situation that where they are and the situation that where they found themselves, even in their community. So without intervening by that and doing this such a conversation from the communities themselves, that if we wait in the government in order to do this thing, so we are going to wait for long. And that means the number of the young, they will getting in the crime more and more rapidly every year. So, and the second thing that we need as a community to have like the organizations, that organization, we can just cooperate together. We are putting them together maybe like by small things, like they make donations, and then we're looking for those donors who they can do right for this kind of uh, activities. And we need to make the something is very special and unique. It's called like the community awareness. I hope that maybe like every week, maybe on the Friday or maybe uh, in the one month, we have got like two times. Let us, as we can go out there and just we meet those young uh, guys, maybe in the big halls, and then we make like something like it's called like community interaction face to face. And we talk to them, what is the problem and what we can do? So we can pick up some uh, individual from that community that will be very effective in order to change the mindset of understanding that means getting into crime. It is not worse than like you will, you have got another option in order to, to promote yourself rather than just like carrying the gun and dealing with the drugs and all this kind of stuff. So if we can do this regard, I think that we can we can solve a lot of issues regarding our youth crime and the crime in South Africa particularly. Because since I came to South Africa in 2013 up to now, I can see there is a slight change in the community behaviors and those criminal activities. So the people, they always they want to know how they are going to adapt this kind of the environment and how they are going to adapt the new uh, uh, life in South Africa. And the, the, the most important part also the police. Because in, in, in our South Africa, you can see the police, they will, they don't have something that's called like, they will intervene or their interfere will be to stop the crime, not after the crime will happen and they come to investigate. No, you need to have the unit. That unit only will focus on, I mean, like watching um, those kind of activities, like in the populations where they are, the populations are big. What they can do, you have got the members and those members, they only reporting to you daily and then, you will must intervene before the accident would happen that if you can stop that it will be the much better than you will wait there until the accident will happen then you come and just make the investigation because since something has happened so why are you making investigation so you will end up by just going to the court and whatever so that we need to have those kind of the rules and the program that which you can do i mean to have our police department units in order to intervene in the certain manner in the just like the moment of the time like that and they can stop this kind of thing and they will have uh, good solution. And also we need a training, we need to train the police. How? Because the police member, they may understand that, okay, if you want to join the police department, that you need to have certain degree of education, because you cannot come there and you are just like illiterate or maybe ignoring the rule of the human being, because you know that the police would have I mean, brutality. So you cannot give the guns to the somebody who do not know how to deal with the community. And we know that in our community that we have got different uh, view and different certain types of the people because in South Africa we are the Rembe, Rembe nation. So, so we are the, the Rembe nation that there is different, some of the small barriers of like the culture and the way of the people that they're, they're, they're acting in their community. So the police member, they must understand I mean, this kind of the, like, the small differences, it is a privilege of the country. So how they are going to interact and respond to this community. So how the community, they are going to love the police rather than when they see the police, they will run away. So that we need to build that kind of the relationship between the police and the community themselves. That means the police member, he will feel free and working in the community without carrying the guns. That means if I commit crime as the as a community member, that how I know that maybe I will be facing my consequences through the law, not because I will run away and I will disappear somewhere because the police is coming there. So uh, that's what I can add in that uh, regard. And I hope that I address issue here. Thank, Thank you, so you so much. Thanks so much, Mohammed. It's also good to get perspectives from someone outside of South Africa who's lived here and has that kind of comparative lived experience. So thank you so much for your comments. Uh, you. I see an, another hand up. I see Martin. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, I just wanted to raise a very quick um, point about 
planning and data because I think it's a problem that's been plaguing us for, for, for a significant period of time. Um, I see kind of the planning regime being out of sync with the data generating regime. And so you've got planning in the in both in the same ministry in the office of the um, the um, the Minister for Planning in the Office of the pre Presidency, but yet there doesn't seem to be um, um, a synchronization of the planning requirements of data and the data provision within Stat South Africa. And, and this has been plaguing us since, um, since the very beginning of, of democracy, um, where we, we decentralize local economic development, but yet we don't create local economic development indicators at a local municipal level. So the state expects planning at the local level, but it doesn't enable it. And so it kind of creates kind of business opportunities for global insight and, and, and the other data provision um, private sector companies. And I think this is something that, is if there is a low hanging fruit, this, this should be easy to affect. The victims of crime survey becomes available at a local municipal level and even perhaps at, low, at a lower level than that. And, and perhaps one should just create a, a kind of coordinated intervention to, to get this, um, coordinated because it's, it's really something that will create, I mean, at the moment, everybody's running around doing their own safety <laughs> audits and all that kind of stuff, having that coordinated data standardized across um, all local areas, I think will create a, the minimum building blocks that Lizette is talking about, that will enable other things to, to happen instead of running around frantically about the basics. Thanks. Thanks so much, Martin. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left. I just want to check if there are any more comments or questions. I don't see any hands raised or anything sitting in the chat. There are obviously are comments that have been contributing to what others have been saying, supporting what other people have been saying. Um, kind of there's been a conversation happening between presenters and, and those making comments. So it's really good to see a very dynamic chat happening. For those of you not following it, please go and have a look at it. Uh, Lauren October, I see your hand is up over to you. Thanks, Guy. Um, so it's just in terms of I don't have a really um, defined question in mind, but just in terms of just the discussion that's been happening, and um, I, I'm, I find myself thinking about what Lillian was talking about. Um, we have to find a real proper way to measure the impact um, of a lot of like how how are we thinking about measuring? And um, with a lot of the work I've been doing, I see that uh, the the gold standard is the randomized control trial. But uh, in a lot of context, like Shanaz was mentioning as well, it, it's not necessarily actually providing a, a, a really detailed explanation of, um, of whether the program is impactful or not. Um, sometimes because we're working in such a fast pace um, and, and we find often that the policy can't keep up and the decisions from higher up, especially if you're starting from top to bottom, the decisions made at the top uh, that can't keep up with the fast changing pace of, of the world that we're currently living in, in our context. So just in terms of, you know, thinking about how, how would we make, um, how would we, how would we implement evaluation, uh, implement programs that are fitting in with the context and measuring them at the same way that is actually keeping up with the pace and has real, um, that measures the real impact of it without, you know, trying to take from the global north and impact and, and saying, okay, this worked over there, so it must work here. And so the policy at the top starts with, okay, we're using this evidence um, from Australia, from Canada, and we try to implement it on in the local level in South Africa, and it doesn't necessarily work. So um, because it's we're trying to keep up with this, but the pace is changing, the dynamics is changing, and COVID will, will show us that any kind of anything will have an impact on the way that communities respond to each other, the way that we, um, the dynamics of the ground level. So my question is just basically how do we how do we um, implement programs and um, measure them in a way that is actually realistic that can show the actual uh, impact on the ground and that that doesn't then you know, take a long time to influence the, the ground up, the bottom up and the top down that where, where there might be a, a, a disjoint uh, between the communication because of how fast paced everything moves. Um, I don't know if my question is making sense because <laughs> it seems all over the place, but uh, maybe the speakers can help me with that. Thanks so much, Laura. Now you raised some very important points and of course your question was very, pretty clear. Um, I don't see any other hands at the moment. So if I could hand back to the panelists, um, if they want to address the, the questions and the comments that have been made, 
Um, so for any of you, if you can just put up your hands or turn your camera on so I can see if you want to address any of the questions. I can go first, Guy. Okay, Matotsi, over to you. Uh, Lauren, um, I mean that's such a that's such a uh, an important question, and I mean I, I don't think I'll cover everything that you've um, you've asked or that you're grappling with. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I'm just going to emphasize one thing that we learned from some of the cases that is that we have done and research that you know influences um, decision. And the one thing is to think about use from the beginning. So a lot of our research processes, even in in sort of even in in administrative data, does not actually take into consideration how this data is supposed to be used and by who and what kind of influences we might want to be um, attaining. And so I think um, you know from the work, some of the work that we have done, starting with that question, even while we are still busy thinking through the design of our research, thinking through the design of our evaluation, can really alter the way that we go about um, generating the evidence, but also can alter even the kind of questions that we, uh, we are asking, the process that we engage with while we are we're still doing the, um, you know, still doing the work. When I was still in DPME, which I know that is not always possible for other, uh, for other institutions to replicate, was that by involving some of the policy makers and some of the program managers in the process of generating the evidence and Guy and, and Shanaz were part of some of those projects where we try and get some of the, the, the people who are implementing programs who are stuck on their day-to-day -day activities, trying to meet up their strategic plans and APP plans and all these things that they have to do within government, try to bring them on board in how their programs were being evaluated was actually a very useful thing because some of them actually got to, for once, took a step back, saw their theory of change, got involved in thinking through what a theory of change is, um, is and, and how you develop indicators in a way that got them to reflect and think of their program differently. But what that also did is that by getting involved in the process of asking policy questions and asking evaluation questions and being parted to the process of, de uh, of generating the, uh, of, of doing the evaluation is that they were learning as we went. So you didn't have to wait until the evaluation was completed, which sometimes did take long and they had to move on while we're still completing the evaluation. But some of the lessons could still be integrated. But I know that it's not always possible that our, you know, our processes can integrate um, uh, implementers in that way. But that's one thing that I think, you know, I've, I've seen in the experience within DPME, but also in this case that is that I was, I was talking to as being an, an important part to changing the way that we, uh, we think about evidence and also making sure that it's used. I've also popped in the chat one example um, from New Zealand uh, of, of researchers who came together with communities, came together with, uh, with communities, uh, the Aboriginal communities, when they were trying to develop interventions to improve health outcomes in those communities, and went about a process of generating knowledge that's very, uh, that's very different, but it's still rigorous and, uh, and really led to a different way of generating evidence, but also making sure that that is actually useful in that local context and actually has an impact in those communities. Thanks, Matotsi. Um, any of the other panelists who want to come in here? Shanaz, Lillian, um, yeah. Zed? Shanaz. Uh, yeah, um, I think, Matotsi, I agree with everything you say. Um, so Lauren and I have been working on a particular project where we've been looking at how evaluations are being done, particularly around interventions and what data is generated. And I think, you know, the important thing, Lauren, and I, I mean, you're asking really hard questions, but the important thing about what the take-home messages there are is certainly that, you know, there is investment in real small-scale studies that doesn't tell us much about what's working in those interventions. And the working with policymakers are very few and absent. And I think it, it is about researchers also taking a step back and looking at our own practice and looking at how we engage both with policymakers and communities, because I, I don't think we should be working in a vacuum. Um, it, 
ethical research means that we've got to be able to not just influence you know, our academic publications and, and um, move forward in our career advancement, but it is about what we're giving back and, and work in a socially responsive manner in order for us to make the biggest impact. And therefore, our guy and, and you might want to reflect back on, on our engagements when we did work with DPME on a particular project, that on the one hand, it's incredibly frustrating, but also quite rewarding, because it is about being able to influence um, decision makers and policy makers as we um, generating the data and taking them along the process, because I don't think it's useful to present findings at the end of your project. I think it's really, really important to take alongside so that there's buy-in in terms of understanding your research, under being able to engage in the research questions and possibly influence it, as well as then being invested in the outcomes of the research. So I think it's about how we consider our research as well, and how we integrate and work within with different stakeholders to actually for our research to have a greater impact. Um, so really, that's over to someone else, maybe someone else on the panel. <laughs> Thanks, Janaz. Mm. Uh, Lillian or uh, Lizette, would you like to come in here at all? If I may, Guy, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think what's important and what still um, becomes striking for me is, is the value of, of collaborating. It doesn't matter at which scale, because um, when we measure um, impact, we, we need to understand um, the context in which we're working. And therefore, whatever research, and we mustn't get to a point where the science um, trumps the, shall I say, the social factors that exist within communities to a point where it's watered down. And it's about really finding a balance between the science and I think what uh, Matozzi coined as the um, qualitative um, narrative kind of inputs that, that contribute um, in, in, in these processes. And I think striking that balance becomes very important, even in the way that we measure. We don't measure just based on a quantitative point of view, but try to understand um, the context in which the data is meant to inform and ultimately impact um, in terms of those societies. Thank you. Thanks, Lillian. Lizette, is there anything you want to respond to in those comments or questions? Just quickly, based on what Matozzi said, it, it reminds me of um, very often in projects that we see implemented, whether it's in the criminal justice system or in communities, um, there's not a complete theory of change that often lead to things not being implemented the way that they should. I have seen it across projects where just getting people to change, getting people to take on board interventions or to um, buy in to these things become problematic because it's not been thought through properly. Um, and, and, and those things are addressed. I've seen it, for instance, in the courts with the prosecutors potentially not wanting to capture things electronically because it just adds extra work, for instance. It's a very simple example, but that shows you the importance of a theory of change. The fact that you need to really make sure you figure out how these things will be implemented in a way that is acceptable to beneficiaries or to role players. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lizette. Uh, we, we kind of pretty much come to the end of the session. We just have a few minutes to spare. Um, I just want to check in with the panelists if there's anything, any final points that any of you would like to raise before I start to conclude the session. Lillian, do you Hi. want to come in here? Oh, Lillian, over to you. Yes, I'm so sorry. Um, or rather, thank you. Um, I cannot miss the opportunity to encourage 
because everyone here is a stakeholder in the implementation of the integrated crime and violence prevention strategy. Um, and I think I want to encourage the collaboration and, and, and the interactions between, yes, the three spheres of government, but all of society in ensuring that there's successful implementation of the strategy because it is communities that need to feel the impact and there needs to be an awareness and a greater reduction of crime and violence as a whole. And I'm talking about, yes, from a policing operational uh, perspective, but also more so from the social crime um, elements of, of, of crime and violence. And so it would be, and you of me if I didn't take an opportunity to just punt the integrated crime and violence prevention strategy or as many would know it as a 2016 white paper on safety and security and of course um, just thank the, the the entire collective of the team for inviting us to participate on this platform thank you so much and um, please do implement the um, integrated crime and violence prevention strategy thank you Thanks so much, Lillian. Just a, just a quick note on that, just as if you're looking for the documents, they're on the Civilian Secretariat of Police Services website, they're on safer spaces for those who haven't accessed it. Also, there's a document that a number of people somewhere in the room have been working on, which is looking at the six themes of the white paper um, and coming up with, you know, um, analysis on what potentially could work within the South African context. What do we know about these issues in other contexts? Not making judgment calls, but really sort of presenting what we know, what we don't know, the state of knowledge within South Africa. So that will, some of you have seen drafts of it. We will be bringing out a final version in the coming few weeks. Um, so hopefully that you'll find useful as well. Um, we are pretty much at the end of our allotted time. I don't see any other hands from the panel members. Um, just to say that we uh, have our next session at 12.30. But before we kind of close it off, I'd really just like to do a virtual round of applause for our four speakers, Oma uh, Lizette, Shanaz, and Lillian. Thank you so much for making the time. And also condensing what you have to say into eight minutes is very, very difficult. It's much easier if you've got more time. So thank you so much for putting that effort in um, and for making yourself so clear and coherent as well. And I think we had a really, really excellent debate to kick off this conference. So without any further ado, there are, if you look at the chat, there are the presenters have their email addresses have been put into the chat so you can access them if you want to make direct contact with them. But just to say thank you to everyone also for participating. I think at the height of the session, we had more than 90 participants. So which is really, really impressive for a Monday morning. So thanks to everyone. Please do join us in our next session, which starts at 1230. You, if you, you should, you need to register for it and you'll get an email giving you the details because each session has its own login. So please do look out for that email if you haven't registered for the session on policing. Uh, please do if you're interested. And then, of course, we have a full day tomorrow as well. So thanks to everyone for your time, and we will catch up with you virtually or in person someday soon. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Guy. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye, thank you. Thank you.